Years ago, I heard a sitting CEO of a Fortune 500 company say that he had three things in his job description, and that was to set the strategic direction, to provide the necessary resources, and to stay out of the way. And everyone sort of laughed. It was about 2,000 people. Everyone laughed, and then he goes, no, I'm serious. The hardest part of that is staying out of the way. I'm so excited to bring back this guest. You may recognize him, Dr. Will Sparks, and he was in season one. Now he's back in season two. William Sparks serves as the Dennis Thompson Chair and Professor of Leadership at the McCall School of Business at Queens University of Charlotte. He also serves as the Managing Director for William L. Sparks and Associates, which is a leader team and organization development professional services firm. He is the author of Actualized Leadership, Meeting Your Shadow and Maximizing Your Potential, which debuted as an Amazon number one bestseller. His TED Talk, The Power of Self-Awareness, was released in 2018. He holds a PhD in organizational psychology from the George Washington University School of Business and Public Management. And here today to talk about actualized teamwork, unlocking the culture code for optimal performance, his new book. It is available for pre-order, and this is all about the model to help teams, groups, and organizations actualize their highest collective potential for optimal performance and higher levels of personal satisfaction. Want to learn more about where you can get that book and about Will Sparks? Be sure to check out the show notes. Welcome to Paradigm Shifts with your host, Keisha Kruger. As an organization development practitioner and executive coach, I work with leaders to create positive changes in the workplace using behavioral science. And here, we're on a mission to rethink the way we work, lead, and ultimately live. So let's unpack light bulb moments for paradigm shifts within your workplace and beyond. Are you ready for a shift? Let's dive in. Hi, Will. Hey, Keisha. Welcome back to Paradigm Shifts Podcast. You were in season one and now you're here with us in season two. And today is a special episode because you actually have a recent book coming out, a new book that kind of builds upon the previous episode's book, which was focused on the actualized leader profile. Well, in this new book, Actualized Teamwork, Unlocking the Culture Code for Optimal Performance, you write about the journey that teams kind of undergo to reach their highest collective potential or what you call team actualization. Can you share with us how this journey begins for most teams and the pivotal moments that kind of signify whether a team is moving closer to that actualization? Yeah. Well, thank you. First of all, Keisha, I'm delighted to be back with you for season two and very excited about the the new book. So I appreciate this opportunity to talk about it. Really quickly, I would say that this book, this new book is actually coming full circle for me. So my work, my research at my master's level, and then my doctoral level was focused on team culture and trying to optimize team performance. And that's back way, way back in the late 90s and early 2000s, and then I sort of moved away from that and got more into the leader development. And so this is coming back full circle, connecting uh, leader development along with team development. And obviously the emphasis is on team culture. So I think that for for the collective and, and by team, I mean three or more uh, individuals right. who share a common goal. They're working. They, physical presence is not necessary. They can work at all parts all over the world, but they're working together in tandem on some project or, or some common uh, effort. And, and, you know, there's just sort of these elements that come together when they are rowing in the same direction, you know, sort of together metaphorically. And that has to do with the, the culture of, of the team. And so in this, in this new book, what I've done is really emphasize the impact that the leader has on culture. In in actualized leadership, I introduced the concept of leadership shadows and how those shadows can impact the individual's development uh, towards self-actualization in a sort of very Jungian, Carl Jung uh, sense that you have to integrate the darkness if you're going to embrace your uh, brightness. If you're going to step into your brightest light, you've got to face your darkest shadow. And that holds true for teens as well. And so here, the, the kind of perspective is very often, in order for a teen to realize or actualize their collective potential team actualization, um, it requires a collective effort of sort of revisiting uh, some of the battles they've had together, things that went well, quite often maybe things that didn't. And the leader sort of stepping up and saying, hey, I, you know, I, maybe I could have done this better in the past or 
or, you know, historically, I haven't given you this information or I've required you to update me on this, whatever the regular basis is. And going forward, I'm going to do better at trusting you all and not micromanaging and really staying out of the way. Years ago, I heard a, a sitting CEO of a Fortune 500 company um, say that his job, he had three things in his job description, and that was to set the strategic direction, but to provide the necessary resources and to stay out of the way. Okay. And everyone sort of laughed. It was about 2,000 people. Everyone laughed. And then he goes, no, I'm serious. The hardest part of that is staying out of the way. He goes, and I would challenge everyone in this room that it's not just the CEO's role, but all of you and your teams provide the strategic direction, you know, in concert with your team's input, provide the necessary resources and remove obstacles, and then get out of their way and let them perform. And that at the heart of actualized teamwork, I'm really sort of revisiting that quote from probably 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago now. That's such a huge part of this. And as I reflect on like my own experiences, having leadership that's kind of in, been in both boats, more micromanaging, and then in contrast, the one that has stepped out of the way and kind of let the employees or that those team members really step up and take ownership like the difference is, is incredible. I mean, those are the experiences where I flourished the most as an individual, where I felt like I was able to contribute the most. I was more innovative, more creative, more, you know, just impactful because of that autonomy and because of that level of trust. And, and so I think that's really, really fascinating to see that the research is really aligning in real life with, with that practical um, experience. So I'm curious, how does this process differ from or maybe even complement the individual journey of self-actualization. So taking it back a little bit to the basis here around that. Yeah, that's a great question. If you, if you think about it in an applied setting, um, they very much sort of go in tandem together. Um, I'll give an example. I Years ago, uh, when I was much younger and just starting out, you know, consulting and, and doing some of this applied work in addition to teaching, I took a lot of team building uh, gigs that were my my sort of request was to go go fix them or um, you know <laughs> we've got ha we've got half a day and we've got some budget so keep it light let's keep it positive stay you know stay positive we want something that's entertaining not too deep and uh, and I would take them and do the best I could and and I've gotten to a place over the last I would say eight or ten years of my career where I, I no longer take those engagements yeah. because if the leader is not willing to sort of get uh, into the trenches with the team then ultimately it will I, I used to think it was kind of a net neutral and i've since come to the view that it's actually a net negative that it actually has a there's a net negative impact where people engage with their full hearts and minds and then they realize that they've essentially been played for four hours and uh and it's back to business as usual it doesn't stay neutral it actually dips mm -hmm. and so i've uh, so, and so there's a process of realizing or actualizing our full potential that uh, can only be, I think, met in the context of the larger group. And if we're talking about an applied setting, the group that we're working with. And so it's an opportunity for for both the leader and the team to sort of grow and develop together. So the leader has to acknowledge the impact that his or her shadow has had in creating the culture that the team has. And then uh, the team has to be willing to engage and meet the leader where he or she uh, will be moving to. And it usually means moving back. So then they're going to have to step up and trust is a huge part of that process. And so very often you have to repair that or build it maybe from the ground up so that there's a collective effort to grow and develop together. And and it's rare that that happens, but when it does, it, it honestly feels like magic. It is an incredible yeah. feeling when an individual, when a leader has the courage to to sit down and say, I am not doing the best that I can do. I am yeah. in the way. I am my temper outburst or the opposite end, my avoiding conflict or being too concerned about, you know, individual feelings at the expense of performance or whatever it may be, somewhere in between. Um, it takes courage for the individual to do that. But when they do, they unlock this sort of incredible energy that's pent up where folks were able, they feel validated, you know, and, and they're willing to then engage in, in an incredibly, in an entirely different level, but it often requires that courage on the part of the leader uh, from, the, from the outset. So what I'm hearing you say is if the leader does not take that ownership, that accountability, and do the work, 
then nothing is going to change in the, whether it's in the team culture, even further out from that. And I think that that's a real significant part of the work that you're talking about here is that the individual has to be willing, the leader has to be willing to step up and take that accountability and that responsibility. And there is a responsibility that comes along with being a leader. And so hopefully that is that is something that when people step into leadership roles, have a willingness to do, correct? It is. I mean, it's hopeful. It's it's not hopeful. always the case, uh, yeah. for sure. You're, you know, it's you have a lot of experience in coaching and change management and team building, and so um, you know, it, it's it's not always the case, but it certainly is. Uh, it's very refreshing when when that is the case, and, and quite often it, it it can happen for purely selfish or self rationally self interested yeah. reasons. The leader can just realize I can't get there from here. So I can't work any more hours. I can't micromanage anymore. The level of complexity is beyond my skill set. The level of technical mm -hmm. expertise, you know, I, I left the technical aspect of this job 15 years ago. So I don't have it. I don't mm -hmm. have the skill set. And so there, there's just this, or, or sometimes maybe the CEO of the company is saying, hey, I think you're the problem. So if you're going to fix them, you got to start with you. Yeah. So however the incentive comes to the individual, sometimes it's pure self-reflection. They hear something at work and they realize the same pattern is showing up in their personal life or vice versa, mm -hmm. or they're getting some a, a gentle or maybe not so gentle nudge from the CEO or whatever, something you know along those lines, mm -hmm. whatever the reason is. If the motivation is pure to, to try to make that change and to trust the process, then um, it is powerful what is available to, to a team and to a leader, but I'm of the opinion that they have to occur in tandem. They have to occur together and trying to go off and do a team building retreat for a half day when the leader is not willing to acknowledge the impact that he or she is having on the team. As I said earlier, mm -hmm. I actually come to the belief that it's not net neutral. It actually can take the team to a, a, a worse place. Uh, because of the frustration that comes through going through an exercise. And, and rightly so, people feel used or betrayed or like, what was that? We just wasted a half day. Nothing's right. going to change. And so the leader has to be willing to engage in that process. And I've been witness to that, that experience as well, whether it's through engagement surveys or, you know, listening strategies, just understanding like that experience that an employee potentially was part of was not it was just ad addressing symptoms right it wasn't addressing root problem and i'm curious if your research has shown are there like specific traits associated with the willingness or desire to take responsibility take ownership over your own self-awareness your own development that is like something that an organization could look out for when they are promoting people. I know this is more idealistic. I'm, I would love for us to be able to like streamline this and put it yeah. in a box. And yeah. I know we're people that's not likely, but you know where I'm going yeah. with this, right? So yeah. Yeah. Well, it's an it's an interesting question. Um, in my model, in the actualized leadership model of the three styles, the achiever, the affirmer, and the asserter, the affirmer tends to be the most willing to be vulnerable, they tend to be the most willing uh, to sort of put themselves out there for the good of the team. And they also just uh, tend to have the highest degree of self-awareness. So when you package all of that together from a style perspective, mm -hmm. there is the style, it's the affirmer. The challenge is that the majority of, of folks that are in those higher levels of leadership tend to be assertors. And so that's the high need for yeah. power, the decisive, courageous, strategic leader that's candid and, and, you know, willing to roll the dice, but also can be arrogant, manipulative, and they have the, they have a fear of vulnerability, that their shadows of fear of betrayal. And so for them to let their guard down and admit that they're part of the problem goes against everything that they've taught themselves and every defense mechanism they've created over their entire life to keep them feeling safe and in so charge and in control. And so it's in, yeah, there is a style that's more likely to get engaged in it. The challenge is, I don't know, a percentage, 65%, 70% of the time, the person sitting in that leadership um, seat as an asserter. So, so if we hold the style question, if we hold the style component uh, for just a moment, kind of say, let's hold that constant, then what does compel a person? And it gets back to that they've bottomed out. They've mm -hmm. hit a place in their life professionally or personally or both 
where they just realize I can I can't get there from here. There meaning the quality of life they want to have, the success they want to have, the quality of their interpersonal or personal relationship. I mean, whatever that may be, they realize I, I'm the problem and they're mm-hmm. motivated to do the work. So essentially when life humbles you, mm-hmm. um, and I've been humbled, you know, many, many times. Um, and when life humbles you, then you're more willing to engage in that introspection and to be a bit more thoughtful and a bit more perhaps willing to be vulnerable and, and, and a little less formal. And those are mm-hmm. small changes that have incredibly large impact, <clears throat> excuse me, with the culture as well. So yeah. it can be a style question or it can be where the person may be in his or her life. Yeah. And so what I don't want organizations or employers or owners or business leaders that are listening to this to say, oh, I should go and find, identify all the different styles of leaders and promote based off of affirmers. Because that, <laughs> what I what I would say, though, is just to connect this back to like a broader leadership development programming consideration is building in those experiences that allow employees or leaders, emerging leaders or you know current leaders to have those reflection opportunities, to be able to build self-awareness, to understand how they're showing up in organizations, what dynamic they're contributing to, getting that peer-to-peer feedback, downward feedback. So does that, you think, position an organization to be super effective in building, you know, stronger leadership as, as it pertains to then having like a really nice cultural. Without a doubt. I mean, I'm a big, big fan of multi your feedback or 360 feedback. And sometimes it takes feedback from a manager or, you know, I've actually seen peer to peer feedback that has been very, very impactful. Yeah. Uh, there may be some tension with your manager. There may or may not be some tension with your direct reports, but when you get peer feedback, Mm. That's saying, hey, you know, you're showing up in this way or you're really challenging to work with on these kinds of issues. Um, I, I've really seen that cause a person to step back and, and reflect. So a, a feedback rich environment uh, is, you know, a very healthy, if a person's open to it, can be a great mm. accelerator for growth and development uh, without a doubt. Yeah, especially if there's that level of respect, the peer-to-peer just hits differently. I totally agree with you. So you introduced this powerful idea that culture isn't just something that happens to you. You happen to it, which highlights the significant role of individual styles and the leadership shadow in shaping the team culture, which is what we've been talking about here. Can you elaborate on the impact that leaders and team members can have on that organizational culture when they actively contribute to it? Uh, actively being the key word. And then particularly, let's look at the lens. Let's look at it through the lens of the ATP or the actualized team profile framework. So the, um, to def- let me define culture, first of all, as we're in the book, in the new book I talk about, it's the perceived attitude or atmosphere that occurs between the dynamic interplay between the official task that the group is working on and then the sh- collective shadow of the group. And that interplay creates a unique culture. So just like the ALP, it comes at it from a psychodynamic perspective, which simply means there's an appreciation for the impact that the unconscious or the shadow has in human behavior. With the ALP, it was the leadership shadow. Well, with the ATP, it's understanding the three corresponding team shadows related to the style. So one of the points I wanted to make is people often complain about you know, my workplace culture, it's bad or it sucks or whatever. And I had to deal with this. And, and a lot of that's true. Like it comes from the top. It comes from the organizational culture, but, and it comes from the leader, but we also, part of it comes from our own individual styles. And so mm-hmm. understanding that we have some responsibility <clears throat> to sort of say, what am I doing to the team when I'm under stress? And so if we look at it from the ATP framework, there are three sort of team shadows. And again, they're directly correlated to the three leadership styles. And so the achiever style has a fear of failure, leadership shadow, and their Achilles heel from a management perspective is they micromanage. And so an achiever that's in his or her shadow and micromanaging, they create what I call a detached culture. And so Mm -hmm. it's exactly as it sounds. It is People don't want to work together. They don't want to be in the same room together. They're looking out of the window. They're looking at their phone. They arrive late. They leave early. They're constantly distracted. They don't know why they're wasting their time trying to, you know, work together in the team. Just let me go do my job. And so 
that's the lowest level of culture. And um, to quote our the namesake of our business school, Mr. Hugh McCall, you know, his solution for that is to find an enemy. <laughs> he said there's nothing mm -hmm. like finding a common enemy and getting in the same foxhole that'll bring a team together and realize we need each other. So metaphorically, a leader dealing with that can find an enemy that we can all sort of get behind and, you know, that we, we need to galvanize to, to sort of go out and defeat. The second uh, shadow, team shadow culture, is what I call dramatic. And that is an, uh, that's a sort of a, uh, an, an outgrowth, if you will, of the affirmer, the warm and friendly uh, individual that has a fear of rejection shadow. And their Achilles heel is that they are conflict avoidant. Yeah. And so they, they sugarcoat the truth and they let's keep it nice. And, you know, so on the surface, it looks warm and friendly. But beneath the surface, there's sort of this white elephant, metaphorically, that's an obvious problem in the room that we all see that we're not talking about. And so that creates a lot of frustration. So instead of high performance from this culture, there's polite conversation and sort of needy emotional aspects, dynamics. And so, again, a, a more courage to call that out and to identify that is, is a key element of, of actualizing that kind of culture. And then the third and the most common in my you know, 30 years of doing this work um, is the, what I call a dependent culture. Right. And that's also the outgrowth of the most common leadership style, especially the higher up you go in an organization, is the asserter. And so that individual, their shadow is a fear of betrayal. And so under stress, they become controlling, autocratic, manipulative, condescending. Again, these are all behaviors to sort of protect himself or herself. And what we create, our Achilles heel is codependency and others. And so we do it at home and we do it at work. We're, we're in charge. We have the answer, you know, and we want to manage it, control every aspect of the situation. And then we scratch our heads and wonder why the team that we're managing isn't innovative. They're not creative. They're not willing to take a risk. They're relying on me too much. Like, yeah, that's probably all true, but we've co-created that. And the, yeah. and the opportunity for transformative development is when the leader of a dependent culture says, holy moly, I have done this. This is an extension of my stuff. Really? This team dynamic is an extension of my insecurity or my need to control or my unwillingness to trust other people. And if I can get myself, if I can deal with that, if I can be more trusting, if I can assume positive intent, if I can ratchet down my need to be right on everything, if I can be less formal, if I can laugh at my mistakes, just all of these things that an, an actualized asserter can and does, mm -hmm. um, then the team feels more willing to take a risk, you know, and to be more innovative. And they literally get out of the shadow of that asserter and they're able to flourish um, and perform at their highest level. And so that's from a leader perspective. But then we all, the members of the team, Mm -hmm. We all have our style and our shadow, and that's how we contribute to it as well. So we have to be wow. mindful that, you know, if I'm in my shadow as an affirmer, and I'm also avoiding conflict, and that, it also makes me very uncomfortable when we get close to having a real conversation about performance or a real conversation about the person sitting around the table that's not pulling his or her share. They're not, you know, if it makes me really uncomfortable and I'm willing to deflect that uh, and let's keep it friendly and talk about the weekend, then I'm contributing to that dramatic culture that I'm also complaining about. So it truly isn't just something that happens to us, but but we happen to it as well. Mm. It's, so in order to understand or see the impact you're having on the team, you need to understand and recognize your unique individual style, your shadow. And then as a leader, facilitating those conversations is really where they take the responsibility into their hands to be able to undo some of the maybe not so positive contributions they've had on that team dynamic. Is it ever too late for a team? Like they've gone too far into the shadow and they can't come back? Uh, you know, I, I would be naive <laughs> if I said, no, it's never too late. You can always repair it. As my late mentor, <laughs> Dr. Jerry Harvey, the <laughs> Abilene Paradox author, he used to say that sometimes Humpty Dumpty can't be put back together again. You know, there are too many pieces and uh, it's been broken too many times. And so sometimes it doesn't have a happy ending. And I and I think that's probably the best way to look at it. If there's too much history, if there have been too many, you know, they're all there's so many different complexities and nuances and histories that individuals and teams have together that sometimes the only way you can transform a team 
uh, is to you know change out leadership uh I, I or or membership or both i mean i think it could be a leader it could be a member that's being very disruptive sometimes it's both and i do think that most of the time you can you know reconcile i do think you can repair things that have been damaged i mean we do that all the time in our personal relationships you know yeah. we, um, we have to apologize and make amends and 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 accept a, a apology and also be willing to ask for you know forgiveness and so we have to learn how to extend that uh to our teammates as well and so I, I i'm hopeful that most of the time i think that it can be repaired and not just repaired but like transformed in a completely new and better way of working together but i think i would be naive if i said that it could always be done because i think the late Dr. Harvey was right about he was about so many other things, which is sometimes Humpty Dumpty, they're just too many pieces. Mm -hmm. Perfectly said. Yeah, so to recap, before I move any further, I'm just going to ask a few questions around these cultural dynamics. So to mm -hmm. recap again, if I'm an achiever and I recognize that my team has a detached culture, What's the first thing I need to do to undo it? And the first thing is to recognize it. I mean, uh, and I think the team has to recognize it as well. So the, the very first step in all of this is awareness, having okay. awareness. And and not just, you can't just have an epiphany individually. You have to have it and then share it with the team and hope that all of them or the majority of them share that awareness as well. So there, there's that component first. So there's awareness and then there's acknowledgement, acknowledging the impact that my tendency to my, let's use the Achin for example, mm -hmm. I'm micromanaging, you know, I'm telling you, I trust you, but I obviously don't because you have to run everything by me or I have to approve everything or I'm going back and redoing your work. So it's completely normal that you, you know, detached and disengaged. And so mm -hmm. acknowledging that after the awareness piece, and then I think coming together with a plan of okay, so how how can we work better together? And the irony is that especially for the achiever, and to a lesser degree the asserter, the so what is to do less. It's to be less directed. It's to sit on your hands or get up and leave or get out of their way. That's what to me is just amazes me so much. Like they know what to do. They have the skills. They have the creativity. It's your shadow that's you know preventing that from happening. And so. If someone is a shadow achiever or a shadow asserter, it can feel very threatening to say, oh, well, wait, part of my job is to do less? And then say, mm -hmm. yeah, part of your job is to build the team, and that means getting out of the way at times. And so very often that's what the, the call to action is to stop doing anything, you know, just get out of the way. Yeah, I love that. So then the call to action or kind of like, like that, that next, next step for all different, all three of those styles would be to acknowledge, or I'm sorry, to be aware of it first, then acknowledge it and own it, own up to it with your team, right? In a shared consensus, and then come up with a plan for how you're going to mitigate it moving forward. Yeah, I would say assimilate. I think that you're really getting at the integrate. How do we integrate the sort of the shadow component and then move forward? And part of it is the sort of the reconciliation of the impact that this has had on others and sort of acknowledging past failures or past, say, less than optimal outcomes and how the culture contributed to that. And then what can we do differently going forward and start that project planning at a more tactical level of here's here are our new rules of engagement. Here are the new here are our new operating agreements. Here's our new social contract. You know, yeah. how, as long as you know as I trust you, then I'm gonna stay out of the way. And so the now the the admission the price of admission for that though is that the team members have to then step up and perform at a different level because if the leader is willing to do that and say i'll yeah. go back and do less if the person stays where they are it creates a gap and there's a performance yeah. gap here. so if i'm going to do less then you have to come up and, and most 90 percent of the time i think people are more than willing to do that and they want to do that because mm -hmm. it's our it's our nature to try to work and live in our you know to flourish at our highest potential and so i think there so if i were to add a third a it would be awareness acknowledgement and then simulation I love that you just like improved that whole framework and I appreciate yeah, that. That's for a 30 year consultant. <laughs> it's like, is it too late to add that to the book now? <laughs> um, so what it would a culture be called then that is actualized? Can you dynamic. talk me through that? Dynamic. Yeah, and that's the name for an actualized culture, whether you're a achiever, an asserter, or an affirmer style. Correct. Correct. So. Just like with the ALP model, I had the four A's, achiever, affirmer, asserter, and actualized. 
in the actualized team model, I have detached, dramatic, dependent, and then dynamic. And so dynamic represents uh, a culture irrespective of the style of the leader that has communication. It's open, it's candid, it's direct, but it's collegial, it's respectful. Uh, there's a high level of accountability that members have, you know, with each other and with the task that members trust each other. And there's sort of a grounded optimism. I mean, it's a it's a like a resilient optimism. It's not Pollyanna. It's not this belief that right. just everything's going to be better magically. It's more of like, well, we've been through this. This too shall pass. And we're going to come out on the other end of this better and stronger than we were. But mm. we got to fight ahead of us. And that's sort of this grounded optimism that I tend to see in uh, the more dynamic cultures. They, they, they all give an example, a counterpart, and that would be a dramatic culture that evades reality mm -hmm. they would rather sort of ignore it or put their head in the sand and let's just hope that things are going to get better and a dynamic culture looks up and stares reality in the face as hard as it may be and says okay here's here's the gap or here's what we're going to be charged with accomplishing and you know th and so there's an ownership piece that comes from engaging uh in reality seeking behaviors as opposed to evading reality and you see more evasion wow. in, a, in a shadow dramatic. Wow. No, that's very enlightening. Thank you for sharing that. So the actualized team framework really is a cornerstone of your approach to understanding and enhancing team performance. So can you walk us through how this operationalizes the concept of culture and um, kind of talk us through the culture code that's really necessary for optimal performance in your work? Yeah, so the in the, the assessment offers a, a free uh, assessment that the reader can take. And if you don't mind, I'll just give it. If someone would like to take it, it's atpfree.com. And that stands for Actualized Team Profile, atpfree.com. And they, they'll get their style and then the impact that they have on culture when they're at their best, actualized, and when they're in their worst, the shadow. And so you get a sense of style, but also the larger part of culture. So there's that part of it where you get a, a slice of it. But the actual culture code comes from completing the full assessment, mm. uh, which then provides a team with their scores on the four scales or dimensions that we've been talking about, which are dynamic, team actualization, detached, dramatic, and dependent. And what I've been able to do over the last 30 plus years now of doing this research is identify what it, what is the range that you want the score to be in and still have right. a high performing team. And so the code, if you will, the culture code gives you in, in the report, you actually see where your desired score range should be and then where it is. And, and you're, if you're in range, that's good. Then you're on target. And if you're out of range, it shows you in what direction and, and by how, how far. Just to quickly go through the numbers, mm -hmm. these are four independent scales. So on the dynamic scale, which is, again, team actualization, you want your score on the ATP, the full ATP, to be 75% or greater. And when you get to that level, then you are communicating directly and honestly. You're listening to each other. You're engaging reality. Uh, you're willing to take a reasonable risk. You trust each other. You you sort of you're able to manage conflict and the like. That's the first scale. The second scale in the in the report is detached, which is actually the lowest level of culture. And so you want that score to be 20% or less. And yeah. so that's the culture code score for detached. For dramatic, it's 30% or less. And so you can sort of see this where yeah. you are again. And those ranges are highlighted. And then for the, the dependent, it's 40 or less. And so when you when you take your report, the way people answer their questions, then you get your culture score. And it tells you, you look at all four uh, ranges. And to be fully actualized, you have to be in range in all four dynamics. And the value of this is that it tells you not only where you are score-wise, but what dimension to work on. So let's say you are in range mm -hmm. in three of the four, but your dramatic score is 56 and you're supposed to be 30 or below so mm. then you're able to sit down and go in the book walks you through exactly what to do when you're out of range and dramatic it's like okay well we probably have a white elephant in the room that we need to talk about we may have a low performer sitting around the table that's you know you need to call that out uh, or another likely is that you're on the road to Abilene, which is the team mm. dynamic of making a decision and agreeing to do something that no one really wants to do. And yet we're doing it every day. And so 
it, there are all of these sort of fun ways to go, okay, now let's ask these questions. And pretty soon you're able to identify what it is that you're doing. Now, this is, and I'm biased, but this is what I think that the value of the ATP provides is that it gives you the benefit of a psychodynamic sort of reading for your team mm -hmm. without ever really talking about, and you don't feel like you're on the couch. You're not talking yeah, about yeah. your childhood. You're not talking about what happened that shouldn't have happened or what didn't happen that should have. I mean, it's just like, oh, we just answered mm -hmm. these 25 questions. And now we're the, the, the sort of factor analytic program spits out this profile code. And, and, and we don't get into the psychology. It's like, oh, well, you need to do these things depending on where your score is. And as you do that, that's oh, the dramatic score. As you identify, let's say, a trip to Abilene and you agree we're not going to do that anymore, that scale in real time, the score begins to diminish. Mm -hmm. And the dynamic scale increases because you're communicating, you're having a real authentic conversation about a sacred cow or something that was undiscussable. And all of a sudden now we're getting it out, we're talking about it, and we're all having this collective experience like, yeah, this, I thought I was the only one. Why in the world are we doing this when no one wants to do it? And so it provides this transformative effect for a team because it's getting at what the real issue is. And it's always the emotional dynamics beneath the surface. And so mm -hmm. it allows someone to identify that without necessarily having to go to Vienna, you know, to study under a psychoanalyst. So this framework is really helpful in diagnosing in tandem. So like the, the comprehensive assessment, as well as the book, which is essentially a playbook to help elevate your current state. Does the assessment tool need to be taken by everyone in the team or just the leader itself? Actually, everyone but the leader. Uh, so let's oh. say you have a team of eight plus the leader. Um, I would have the leader take the ALP, the leadership profile, and then I would have the team only take the team profile, and then you can sort of lay those out together. Uh, and I would almost guarantee you eight and a half or nine times out of ten, if you have an asserter, uh, you're going to have, you know, a culture that leans toward dependent. If you have an affirmer, you got one that leans toward dramatic. If you have an achiever, you're going to likely have one that leans toward more detached. It depending on the self-actualization of the leader right? and the, you know, because that impacts the, the dynamic scale for the team. So if I'm the highly self-actualized achiever, then their detached score is probably going to be pretty low because he or she knows stay out of the way, don't micromanage, don't pepper people with questions. You know, they feel attacked. Yes, we got to think about the data, but let's <laughs> also think about the big picture. You know, what are we trying to accomplish here? These are all things that an actualized achiever does more naturally than say a shadow achiever. So I would have the leader take the ALP and the team take the ATP and then put them together for, you know, sort of a comprehensive development experience that ends up being leader and team in mm. tandem. Sounds so transformative. Um, before I move on to my next question, does the, um, so I have taken the ALP several times and it's the same <laughs> just because I do it for fun. <laughs> it's the same every time I'm the starter. <laughs> right. However, I imagine if I am doing the team profile, the actualized team framework, you had said it's kind of like a snapshot in time. Would I be taking, like, how often do I take the, get my team involved in order to understand have, if we've had that elevation in actualization or if we, mm -hmm have other work to do? Yeah, that's a great question. And the, the first part of what sort of what's embedded in that question is the realization that an ATP is an indirect 360 on the leader. So that's the other part about that too. So if your team takes the ATP profile and you look at their culture score, their culture code and the degree of the shadow, quite often, not always, quite often it's a reflection, a pretty good reflection of your style and your shadow as a leader. As mm. far as the frequency of taking it, I would say that you know, every three to six months, uh, probably, you've got to give time for changes to sort of gel. You've got to, you know, you might have an immediate hit up, like a, a good score go up, and then it could re it could come back down if those behaviors aren't anchored, if new behaviors aren't anchored mm -hmm. in trend. But I do think it's good to reassess because, first of all, if you have gotten more dynamic and you're more actualized as a team, it's great validation, and it sort of gives a for momentum, you know, to keep going and keep fighting the good fight. And if you've gone in the other direction, then it's not going to tell you anything that people don't already feel on some level 
but it validates whatever they may be feeling. And it's, it's kind of like a little bit of a wake up call to say, wait a minute, we, you know, we are not honoring our agreements or something else is going on. And so it allows you to just sort of take the temperature and make sure that you're mm-hmm. moving in the right direction. Yeah, I guess I was curious if you've mapped it to some sort of like stages of team development by like Tuckman or like, is there a certain part of the team development stage cycle that would be an important time frame to like go in and like check the temperature? Um, I disagree with Tuckman that state that teams develop in a linear fashion. That was mm-hmm. part of my dissertation research. And so if you go back and read Tuckman's paper from 1965, he talks about these sort of stages, but his perspective, I won't say his error, but his perspective was <laughs> teams develop in linear sequential stages, just like right. individuals do. And we can pretty well map that on to kids that are growing up in different stages they're going through in their development. And um, and so the theorist, the main theorist that he cited, Wilford Beyond, gives us the descriptions of these stages, but Beyond never said that teams develop in a, in a linear sequential mm. pattern. So my research through Jerry Harvey at GW was also, I mean, he was a huge Wilfer Beyond fan and the actualized team profile was based on Wilfer Beyond's work, but it doesn't assume that you start at forming and then go to norming. It, it assumes mm-hmm. that you start wherever you are and an important change in leadership or membership or transformative experience can take you from wherever you were up to, in Tuckman's terms, would be performing. In my terms, it would be dynamic, bypassing one or two of the other stages. Likewise, you can be at that high level of performing, and another change could happen, and you could immediately regress back to, um, in this case, forming or storming, which would be dependent or detached in in my model. So I don't, and and the research I've done over the years, I mean, sometimes teams develop in that linear sequential pattern most of the time I, I think they don't um mm-hmm. so when when to assess is there a stage or a pattern probably it just depends on is there something right now where we feel like we, we've made an improvement or we're going in the wrong direction because yeah that i'm a big i'm a big believer in sort of intuition and when you feel or you intuit that maybe now is a good time to do that you could be in any of the stages and it would be the right time to assess because if you're going backwards, you want to get that as soon as you, before you go any further back to sort of reset um, and redirect. And if you are in a dynamic state, then you want to, you know, you want to have that validation, I think, uh, increase the momentum uh, for the team as well. Now that's, that makes us super clear. And I agree. I've never subscribed to that linear stages of team development as well. Um, just from my experience, I've observed quite the opposite, lots of back and forth and just yeah. jumping around. So it, that makes it really, exact, really clear. Keisha, that's the exact right way to say it. It is a, it is a very dynamic, it is a very nonlinear, very mm-hmm. fluid situation. And when the, the team, when the, when the goal changes for the team, yeah. when the task changes, when one member leaves or somebody yes. else the team or a new leader yeah. comes in, I mean, it just, it is, you can't predict what's going to happen. So it, to your play, you've seen, you've seen that in yeah. the real world. And so, I mean, Tuckman's model is very, it's very effective from a category perspective. Like yes. Categories are right. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, those are the four, you know, sort of categories, if you will. But, but I think the mistake is we think, oh, well, we're, we're in, we're in, we're still in forming. So we've got to go through norming and storming right. and norming we get to that. Yeah, and I don't. I just don't think that's the case. Yeah, I agree. I teach people as well that when you have a new team member that joins the team, you have a whole new team. Like so, this is like going through the whole. Where I think the value of a a development process like that is really just being able to identify where you are if you are for me, right? Being able to align with that categorization. But I think what's really cool is that your assessment is kind of giving you that culture code at any point in time and that it could really be integrated into a team's experience when the leader says, you know, ask themselves a couple key questions like, is our team experiencing turmoil or maybe some sort of dramatic shift or drastic shift that we might need to be prepared for or we might need to work through and resolve? And so I think those are great questions to ask yourself if you're, or, you know, of course, like you said, use your intuition and lean on your intuition. So I don't have your book yet. But you did share with me that your book features insights from leaders across various sectors who 
have embraced actualized teamwork within their organization. So can you tell a little bit about some of the key less maybe transformative or even surprising lessons that you've learned from those leaders and have maybe embraced it already. Yeah, so there are, there are a number of leaders uh, in the book that, that I have profiled and interviewed that are familiar with my work, I've worked with over the years, just like we do with actualized leadership. And so the forward for the, the new book is written by the Charlotte Hornets head coach, Steve Clifford, who I've worked with now for 11 years. And so he sort of sets sets up the book by saying, Teams uh, don't operate at their level, at their skill level. It's above or below. It's that's kind of a take on the former uh, Hall of Fame head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, Chuck Knoll, who said that essentially that teams never perform where they should on paper. It's either above or below, and the coach's job is to get them above. But what determines it is the culture or the chemistry. And so Steve sort of took that that perspective in writing the board and said, "This is why this matters and why it's important." Then. In the section of the book where I talk about the five Five dimensions dimensions of teamwork, I profiled different individuals for each of those. And I could maybe just quickly go through those. Um, Marlene Hendricks is the chief customer experience officer for U.S. Auto Trust and is an actualized affirmer through and through uh, and facilitates uh, leader and team development workshops using the ALP and the ATP. And she just, and, and her talk on communication is just terrific. She talks about how important it is to be open in communication. It needs to be two-way. It can't just be one-way and directive. And that means being open to feedback as well. And so she gives a, she has a great story too. Before she went over to U.S. Auto Trust, she was the uh, chief guest experience officer for SoFi Stadium. And so mm. SoFi Stadium has set the new standard in what it's like to go and experience a game or a concert. And they had just hosted the Super Bowl the year that the Los Angeles Rams, the home team, won in SoFi. And Sports Illustrated did a four or five page color article on on Marlene and her journey and story. It's just incredible how she came to the U.S. and the life that she's created and her sense of gratitude. And it's just a it's just if anyone is interested, you can Google. Marlene Hendricks, Sports Illustrated. It's just such a mm-hmm. inspiring and compelling story, and it's just it's told with such humility and grace uh, that she has. And so I'm so grateful to her, and really honored to to feature her uh, in the, in the book as well. So she's one of the leaders that talks about communication. Conflict management is the second dimension of actualized teamwork. And Kathy Patterson who's the chief human resource officer for Ally Financial or Mm -hmm. Ally Bank, uh, gave a great interview with with conflict management. Her her really takeaway uh, that she shared in the book with the readers is that make sure you reflect, that you carve out time for reflection after you've had a difficult conversation. You know, it's okay to vent. It's okay to, you know, to sort of vent in the car on the way home or vent over a glass of wine or whatever. But she says there's a difference between venting and reflection. And so make sure that you build in time to reflect on what went well, what was something that maybe was said in anger and that hurt your feelings, but perhaps has a nugget of truth that's developmental for for you as well. And so Kathy gives a great, and she's been on the front lines of that as a, you know, as the chief human resource officer, a lot of her day is, you know, filled with conflict and managing conflict. So a great resource uh, for us there. Um, And I I should have mentioned that I used the metaphor of an iceberg and, and, the first mm-hmm. three dimensions are above the surface of the ocean, and the third dimension, but it's right on the waterline, is engagement. Mm-hmm. So that is, uh, you know, kind of getting at this notion of how are we participating, and you can sort of see it, but sometimes you can't quite directly observe it. And the wait, what's the, under the water? Uh, under the water is purpose and trust. And very okay, dangerous. you were going to leave us hanging, and everyone no, 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 like, "What's no, under I, the water?" <laughs> communication, conflict <laughs> management, engagement, and then under the water, purpose and trust. Trust and so is it, that like definitely like the depth, core depth of it, like everything, it, right? It's, it's the deepest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jonathan Halker is the leader that I interviewed for engagement. He is the CFO of MGM Resorts. That was by far the coolest interview I got to do. I went to the Bellagio out in Vegas. If you've yeah. seen Ocean's Eleven, you know, the, the Andy Garcia's character was the um, CEO of the Bellagio. And so I was like, this is like a, a movie. <laughs> He's such a great guy. So humble and down to earth and talked about 
um, had really thought about it and we sat down and he just gave such a thoughtful interview on how to increase engagement and to realize that if your team is lower in engagement, it's probably something that you're doing or not doing that you should be. And so again, I'm very, mm -hmm. give a very reflective interview about the responsibility that the leader has for making sure that, that it matters to the individual team members. And I really appreciated, he really sort of from an applied perspective, underscored and reinforced this notion that, you know, the shadow of the leader has a direct impact on the performance of the team. And so great interview there. Really quickly, the last two purpose. Um, again, now we're below the surface, uh, the waterline surface. That's Brian Savoya, who is the CFO of Duke Energy, headquartered here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Brian, also a very thoughtful uh, interview, talked about purpose in all arenas of our life, you know, and that we have to sort of be a purpose-driven individual at home, right. with family, with kids, with spouse, and then also thinking about being a leader that, you know, he said, I want, my, I want to be the kind of father that my children want to emulate, and I yeah. want to be the kind of leader at work that my, you know, that my team wants to follow. And he made a great connection between those two and really how you have to tap into the purpose of the individual has to align with what you're doing as a team and an organization. And that sometimes it's the leader's responsibility to ask the right kind of coaching questions that allow the individual team member to make the connection like, oh, well, mm -hmm. my purpose is to serve others. Now I have an understanding about the work I'm doing and how that helps the greater good. And then finally, at the deepest level is trust. And I was very, very honored to have James Jordan, who is now the president and chief operating officer of the Charlotte Hornets and has a very famous older, uh, younger brother, brother, I'm sorry, Michael's younger and James, uh, who gave a great interview on trust. And he drew most of that from his 34 years as a U.S. Army airman who are there at the tip of the spear. They, they go out of planes in parachutes. And I think he had uh, five tours in between Afghanistan and Iraq. And he really drew down on his military experience and how important trust is, you know, when you literally, your life depends on it mm -hmm. and how he then takes those lessons and applies that in an organizational setting. And so it's a very sort of no nonsense, you know, sort of right between the eyes. Here's what you got to do. People pay attention to what you do, not what you say. Okay. They watch who you talk to, they watch who you don't talk to. And so there are a lot of very sort of tangible takeaways from that interview. And again, it's these tangible, sort of like, okay, here are things that we can do or stop doing that are going to have this impact down here in these murky, icy waters Right. Now where the iceberg is that we can't see, and maybe you don't even want to go down and see, but we know we can have a positive impact on trust and purpose and engagement, you know, when we do these, uh, these kind of tactical recommendations that the leaders provided. Right. And it sounds like it just makes everything else easier when it comes to like communication and, and all the other um, aspects that you were talking about. Those are some big hitters, Will. Yeah, Congratulations. I'm, thank you. I'm very, very humble uh, that, that yeah. they were willing to work with me on this and, and truly indebted because they, and without without exception, all five of these individuals are just terrific leaders um, and, and mm -hmm. I have a, we have a lot to learn from them. So I'm, I'm honored that I'll be at least a small part of the platform that they can uh, that they can help others as well. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. Going back to before we wrap up, you we had mentioned that you offer a free assessment tool for readers or anyone um, to evaluate their style and their likely impact on culture, which I will put in the show notes as a link, but just to repeat it, it's www. And participating in that tool, that assessment tool is a real good practical first step for readers and listeners as well to engage with the concepts of actualized teamwork directly. But is there anything else that you would share as like next actionable steps towards actualization that you think is important for those listening? Well, I think that from a from maybe from a practical perspective, you know, if you're at a place with your team where you feel like you would benefit from doing the team profile and actually looking at the culture and seeing where you are instead of trying to guess, I think it's always helpful to have that. Yeah data in front of you so you know that could be a next step to to and that's kind of a shameless plug but if you wanted to take the full profile you could you could look at your results that way from a more sort of personal you know theoretical perspective i think it's just the realization that teams just like individuals have this 
shadow side. And for some reason, I feel like the individuals are maybe a little bit more willing to go like, yeah, okay, I have an unconscious. Yeah, I can be on autopilot or I have a shadow if they're young and then they're willing to have a shadow. Maybe not quite as willing to say that with the team because we're like, well, no, but we, we have an agenda and we have, we have minutes from our meeting and we, you know, we're all of this and that. Well, that's all true, but research clearly, I think, with, without a doubt, shows us that groups and teams have the shadow component as well. So I think just having that realization that it's there, mm -hmm. think about it as the shadow maybe under the table where you're meeting. And yeah. the, the more you ignore it, you do so at your own peril. The, the, it's just like the individual shadow. The more we deny it or repress it or project it on the others, the more we feed it. And so I think just yeah. having a realization that it's there and it's having an impact is it's a huge sort of next step in taking that, starting that journey to really actualizing both the individual and the collective potential of your team. Yeah, the larger it gets, right? Yeah. No, I think that that's a great next step. And where and when can people get the book if they want to get it? That's a great question. It's finished. It's with the publisher. <laughs> My publisher, uh, again, this time is the Society for Human Resource Management, SHRM Press. And uh, we are recording this at the very end of March. And in my understanding that it will be available for pre-order in April uh, and that it'll be out in May. So fingers crossed Yay. that we stay on the timeline. So hopefully at some point in April, you'll see it uh, available for pre-order on Amazon. And if you're still with us, I will definitely leave the link, the live link to that book in the show notes. One final question here, and true to our paradigm shift's nature, what is the most recent paradigm shift you've experienced, Will? I will be completely honest, Keisha. Um, I knew <laughs> you were you going to ask that question, <laughs> and I, I forgot. I forgot you were going to. So when you're sitting here saying that, I kind of leaned in like, okay, where, where are we going with this? But I'll tell you, my most uh, important paradigm shift lately, and I thought about this when I said life humbles you, and I've been mm. humbled many times. I have a 15-month-old at home, who's my best little buddy, Bennett Lee Sparks, Aww. and I love him more than anything in the world. Uh, and he has one humbled me and continues to do so. Just when I think I've got the sleep schedule figured out, just when I think I've got the feeding figured out, just when I think I know what's going to make him laugh and what to avoid <laughs> so he won't cry, he changes the rules and, uh, and I am humbled yet again and again and again. So that uh, has been not only my most recent shift, but the greatest um, shift I've ever had in my life. Because at my advanced age, I didn't think that was in the cards. And I'm now able to watch life through his eyes. And I've started doing things like stopping and reading uh, monuments to him and going to the national parks and doing some mm -hmm. other things that I, you know, just wouldn't have done. And I can sort of see my childhood coming back. So I, I feel sorry for him because as soon as he's big enough to play Star Wars and go hunt for Bigfoot, we're going to be out in the woods squatting and we're going to be playing with Tide Hiders and Millennium Falcons. So I hope he's, <laughs> hope he's ready. No, I love that. Thanks for sharing. So you heard it here first. Stay humble, stay flexible and stay curious. Thank stay you everyone curious. for tuning in. Thanks Will Sparks for Me all of your incredible insights and knowledge. Thank you so much.